I'm Joanna Booth. I'm a local journalist working freelance and I'm an avid tweeter. Many people say to me, you tweet a lot. And um, <laughs> I don't think I do. I think I tweet a normal amount, but I don't think other people tweet as much as they could. You were looking a bit at the nighttime economy, which seems to have developed quite a strong lobby in Bristol, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. We now have a, a kind of a nighttime SAR, which is nighttime economy advisor, Carly Heath. And the strength of these groups seems to have started to spread. This idea of a nighttime economy advisor started off in London and then traveled to Manchester. It's, it's effectively someone who lobbies to get the nighttime economy's voice heard. But the, the concept of it came from a report funded by LNG, the huge insurance people who are also involved in regenerating cities with the English Cities Fund. Um, so they have a very a vested interest in what happens in cities and how they are developed. Well, and, and also, of course, Temple Island in Bristol were a very important and massive development being done by the university. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So, yes, yeah, so LNG were given planning on Temple Island after the Meg cancelled the arena there by ensuring that YTL were given planning agreement. And this isn't, isn't me making this part up, this, this judgment. This was how Nigel Greenhold, the arena consultant, was introduced. They want someone hired by Bristol City Council to make sure that YTL got their planning. So, yeah, so LNG have got their, their plan there at Temple Island. So the nighttime economy advisor was proposed a couple of years ago. So, in, so last year, over a year ago now, I asked the council, how did this role come up and who's paying for it? And they said that the funding was going to come from industry, which is why they introduced that it was going to be a part-time role funded by partners supporting sound diplomacy project, as they tell me, and 15000 was going to come from the public health COVID outbreak management funding. In the end, because of lockdowns and because of COVID, the sound diplomacy work was delayed for a financial year and growth and regeneration budget provided the source of the funding for it. So at that point, it was £30,000 for a part-time role. And later on when I asked, well, I should tell you actually first who the industry people were that were supposed to pay for it. So I was given I mean, seven names and they are Dealey Freed, and Dilly Freed at that time was the master of the Merchant Venturers. Um, Dilly Freed is a construction company, a development company, and they're the ones who have the galleries project. They're the ones that are going to be redeveloping that whole site. Uh, also, other funders of the work are Lakota, Motion, Places for People, Capital Limited. They were involved also in the Froome Regeneration Project. Well, I mean, they're also, I mean, they're involved in this massive St. Paul's, well, it's a sort of fenced off um, waste ground at the moment, but a potentially massive development in St. Paul's. Oh, right. Well, I guess that area, yeah. Um, also, the two bids, Bedminster bid, Bristol City Centre bid, and uh, University of Bristol. These are the people who are going to be funding the work. But so far, we have been funding it, the people, for what is effectively a kind of a, a lobbyist for the nighttime economy. Carly Heath is a nighttime economy advisor. Now, it seems amazing that there is a, a, a role that's been set up um, that is actually lobbying for these private businesses, but it's being paid for by uh, out of council tax. Yeah, that's right. That's, and that's part of what really astounded me, that we're funding them. Um, you know, we're, we're actually funding the lobbying for huge companies like Dealey Freed and the University of Bristol. The you know, University of Bristol has a £100 million capital project each year, which they use to buy things like property around and assets. And they're building a, a, a huge campus near Temple Island. So you've got to wonder why we're paying £50,000 for, one, uh, for some, the lobbying for them. Well, it's amazing, isn't it, that the council cannot actually afford, apparently, to educate children with special needs, and yet they can afford yes. to pay for lobbying of this kind. So what's been the actual effect of Carly's work? Yeah, part of it is quite opaque. I mean, they've set up, so Carly Heath is the chair of a kind of a nighttime board. I think we are Bristol, the nighttime economy board. Marty Burgess used to be the head of it. I think she's now co-chair. Marty Birch is part of Lakota, who are also the funders for this work. Well, she's also a merchant venturer, Marty. Yes, yes, she is now. Yes, you're right, absolutely right. She's also a merchant venturer, as is Dilly Freed. 
Yeah, so Mohammed Sadiq, who used to be, I don't know if he actually is part of the University of Bristol still, but he is also a merchant venturer, I think. Also part of Wessex Water. But anyway, that's an aside. So one thing that I have seen um, Carly Heath do is be involved in a grant from central government, from the Home Office, for drink spiking. So a couple of, I believe it was two years ago now, that Bristol applied for some drink spiking grant money to stop all these things happening in nightclubs, and we were awarded £280,000, which seems a good amount of money to fight drink spiking in nightclubs. But it turns out that out of that money, only £20,000 went to actual drink spiking kits, and the rest, 100000 went to the PR company, which I believe was Plaster. Um, 40000 went to the bid, to Bristol City Centre bid, so they could get someone to do sexual harassment training for nightclubs. And the uh, 35000 went to a website and to uh, some kind of constitution to say that women shouldn't be sexually harassed. It was something like that. So, you know, out of £280,000, this kind of money was was kind of parceled out to the usual figures. And these are all people in, I mean, I'm, I'm, this information was in the culture board minutes, um, part of the one city. What about your local area? Um, have you found that the licensing of premises is working around there? Oh, that's another good question. <laughs> well, so I live in the harbour side, right near Prism. And when I first moved in, I mean, I moved in 2010 in this area, I was a few hundred metres away from 2005. But when I moved in, there was kind of, there was an M&S, there was no Tesco, you know, there was a Pizza Express, but it was a, there, was, there were no licensed premises apart from what is now the Slug and Lettuce, it used to be called the Living Room. And over the last 13 years, every single place basically has become a licensed bar. There's a co there are two cocktail bars, there's Lane 7, which is outdoor seating, Brewdog open next year. And I should mention that we have the last remaining cumulative impact area zone kind of thing um, in the city where it's supposed to prevent the accumulation of kind of the clustering of too many places because it becomes too much of a hazard for residents and basically makes it tough to police. But the only thing that the CIA has done, this kind of cumulative impact area zone, is, re is um, stopped these licensed premises for opening past 12 a.m., so kind of midnight. That's it. But at the moment, the council are trying to stop that again. I mean, this is something that gets kind of reviewed and renewed every couple of years. So once again, we're looking at having to fight to keep it in place just to stop these newly opened bars from opening even louder. I mean, we have Brewdog, which opened up last winter, is now open till midnight. It's limited to open to midnight. They wanted to push that open even further. And then next to two residential um, kind of high rises and opposite ours, where and across the road there are four, five more. I mean, we're just it's surrounded by residences. We're in a place that was supposed to be as part of the harbourside development back in the early two thousands, be a residential area, but the kind of the administration with its new focus and and on promoting the nighttime economy has really pushed all these places into becoming licensed bars, and you know, and it gets very tough. Yeah, well, the problem is, of course, that if you've got people trying to sleep when there's loud noises, whether it's yes. people hanging around outside shouting, chatting, laughing um, at two in the morning, uh, or whether it's loud music, there's all sorts of noises associated with these nightclubs that you've got yeah. to have a very tough, strong licensing committee who will uh, alter the conditions of the license. Uh, otherwise, you will get, and it's, 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 this is absolutely inevitable, eventually get fights, fisticuffs, uh, where yeah. residents that can't sleep then g have to go and deal with the, the cause of the noise themselves. So I wonder, you know, wh where you think we are with the, the strength and the beefed up, uh, how beefed up the licensing committee is. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, we've had people running out of here, you know, running across roads, chasing each other, sort of arguments down outside our windows. And, and people do, they linger, they talk outside, you know, they come through in kind of groups. So the licensing at the moment, I mean, it's chaired by Marley Bennett, Labour Councillor Marley Bennett, who also works for Turley Planning Associates, and he's also part of Growth and Regeneration, and he's also recently being made Director of Bristol Holdings. And kind of as a resident block, we're happy that Brewdog didn't extend 
their li- they didn't get their license extended past midnight, but it's not stopped anything else. You know, these places are still opening up. Par 79 or whatever the golfing bar is called, the Millennium Promenade, that opened just a few months ago as well. There doesn't seem to be any push to protect the residents against kind of the income that comes from night climb, nightclub. So you, you're just suggesting Marley Bennett is working for planning consultants because, of course, this is a major part of uh, any new, kind of new development planning applications is the licensing angle to it all. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a, I mean, planning is a material consideration in licensing, so they'd have to take count of it. And, yeah, he, he, and in his register of interest and his Twitter bio, from what I last saw, unless he's changed it, it said he now works for Turley Associates. And they were, I mean, they've, they've been involved in quite a, a couple of very big projects in Bristol. You know, they're based in Queen Square and they work with the Bristol developers. And he is the chair of Bristol licensing, as well as having a role in so many other committees. I think, I'm sure there's one I forgot. I think he might be in audit as well. But the fact is that, you know, the chair of licensing is also working for a planning, you know, a planning consultancy. Can you just let listeners know where the best place is to follow you online? Obviously, Twitter is probably your main one. Yes, Twitter is my main one. You can find me there at Still Awake. And I've got a link there to my Substack, which is at joannab.substack.com, where I publish kind of exclusively on local authority issues um, about Bristol. Joanna Booth, thanks very much for your contribution and more power to your elbow. Thank you very much, Tony. Very nice speaking to you.